I'll be handing this off to Michael Lorenz. And the speaker will be Peter Coleman. I just want to say that in 1999, um, I was at Mercy College. We decided that we must have a conflict resolution program. And I was a student in Peter Coleman's class in 1999. Has this been a fantastic conference? This is one of, yes. This is one of those very unusual situations where a number of public intellectuals, and we don't talk about that any, any, anymore, unfortunately, have come together to look at how to solve problems. So we've had two full presentations. First, we had uh, Professor Bangura uh, gave us the predicate for understanding how problems come about. And I say problems, not disputes or conflicts, but problems. And then we had the wonderful, presenta uh, wonderful presentations, all equally wonderful, uh, where we learned about situations that occur organizationally and with individuals. Now we're going to have a person who's going to talk about what to do about the problems. How do we address them? And we're going to have three parts within this area. Uh, I have to tell you, I have to admit something. I, when uh, Basil asked me about uh, Peter Coleman, do you know him? And said, well, the name is vaguely familiar. And when I saw the face, yes. And I couldn't remember from where. I thought it was the United Nations, probably. And then I realized something else, too. Uh, I have my white hairs as well. <laughs> and I remembered that when I teach mediation as well as business. Shh. And one of the things that I had done is I'd used some of your articles from 2007, 2009, uh, Conflict Journal, or Conflict Quarterly, and Negotiation. And I said, I did not connect the name with the face. So we've had a number of really fascinating persons speaking today. And now we're going to have uh, Professor Peter Coleman. Take note, I said Professor Coleman, because in Europe and most of the world, you have a doctoral degree, you have a professional degree, that's wonderful. But when you reach the title professor, as Professor Bangura, who has five doctoral degrees, that is distinctive. And then we have, so we have uh, Professor Coleman, who will give a wonderful presentation, an exciting presentation, which I hope we will all listen to attentively. And then we're going to have, as the discussant, my dear colleague who made it from the great Midwest, from Northern Illinois University, uh, Department of Sociology. And he's going to be the discussant, and I will have the pleasure of speaking with you as your moderator, uh, if I can stop listening for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. So can we welcome uh, Professor Coleman? Sure. Michael, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, can, you hear, can you hear me if I move around a li little bit? Great. Um, so I am uh, going to speak about mediation as a process through which um, some conflicts can be addressed and resolved. Uh, ideally, we can sort of try to build peace, more peaceful relations. Um, I wanted to go back for one second to a question that was asked earlier. I'm not sure if the person's still here, but it was about, the, about our DNA and about human nature. Um, and it's an important question because I think there's oftentimes a big misunderstanding about human beings. I think that there's a, there's a fantastic new book out by an anthropologist named Douglas Fry, who is an anthropologist of peace. He's actually a, kind of a, just a regular anthropologist, but for the past 20 years or so has been studying peaceful societies. He's written several books, and the most current is called uh, War, Peace, and Human Nature. And he makes clear in this book that if you look back in the history of, of humankind, that actually war is a relatively recent innovation. And that for most of our history as hunters and gatherers, we didn't do that. We depended on each other. We were highly collaborative. So the idea, and, so, and what he's done in his book is study and identify 77 uh, uh, societies that are internally peaceful and I think 86 that are regionally peaceful and to try to understand what are the basic conditions that are conducive to more peaceful societies and part of why he did that is to debunk the myth that we are kind of fundamentally warriors and, and, and territorial to, to the death. That is a construction that we've 
created, we have certainly violence in the world and violence in society, but it's really important to understand that our foundation is really peace um, and that this is an aberration and it's something that can be addressed. And one of the key things that he finds in his research is that a critical component to all societies that are peaceful is having a capacity to resolve conflicts constructively, right? And that's what I study. I'm a professor at Columbia. Uh, and what I've been asked to talk about is mediation. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about mediation itself and some research we've been doing on what is it, what isn't it, uh, how, is imp how important is it, and how can we be most effective with it. I wanted to ask how many people in here are mediators or med have done, OK, that's good. All right, so about half or so. Great. Um, so, uh, and I particularly want to focus on the science of mediation because um, I, I will argue that there hasn't been great science. There's been a fair amount of research on mediation, but it's a little bit all over the place. Uh, and so what we've been trying to do is kind of bring it together and bring some clarity into what can science tell us, social science tell us, kind of systematic research about mediation and how to make it more effective, okay? Um, so the UN uh, has gone won through a series of re uh, resolutions uh, uh, through uh, originally through the General Assembly um, to kind of take a serious look at mediation uh, and understand what it is and what it isn't and how to move uh, the uh, mediation forward. Um, and so in 2008, there was a proposal to start to really carefully study mediation within the UN. Uh, and then in 2011, there was a resolution passed and they were asked to try to bring the best ideas from mediation internationally together into a set of guidelines, which really was the first ever set of uh, guidelines sort of canonized about what is me good practice in international mediation. And so that um, uh, was proposed in 2011. We were asked by the Mediation Support Unit of, the, uh, of UNDP to contribute to that. Um, and so what we did, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, a social scientist, so what we did in my lab with my students is we kind of went and took a hard look at the literature on mediation and said, well, what has the research told us which would be useful for an envoy who's going into South Sudan trying to make a difference? Like, is there useful advice or guidance that's coming out of the research that we can bring to bear on on these critical processes. So we were asked to contribute to this set of guidelines, and so we went to the research to, to study it, and you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and we were also asked to help convene an academic advisory council to help both the guidelines and the mediation support unit sort of stay as close as they could to the science on, in this area. So our, our, our group did a thorough scan of the research over the last 20 years on mediation, and what we found was sort of wanting. What we found is that there, is a lot, there are a lot of studies, they're a bit all over the place, um, and it's really hard to know what are the uh, strategies and tactics that mediators use um, that are particularly effective, what are the kind of conditions that allow certain strategies to be more and less effective? And we really didn't know what that was. So we, um, and there was a, if you go to the next slide, there was a review of the research on mediation in 2012. Uh, and they said that the literature from the decade is pre, as in the pre preceding 10 years indicates that mediators have about 100 different tactics that they can use. So there's a, a great toolkit out there. And the richness of that is great because it means that we can be sort of artistic in how we go about addressing conflicts constructively and as third parties helping reach negotiation, reach agreements. Um, but the bad news is it's hard to know then which are particularly effective when we really don't know how to both understand the major causes and consequences of why mediators use certain strategies and which are particularly effective in different situations. So we've been trying to kind of bring the science together in some kind of coherent fashion through a series of studies, and that's what we'll talk about. So if we can go to the next one. So the first thing we did is we just looked at the literature, sum summarized it, and said, what are people studying? Like, what are the key things in mediation that matter, right? And the next slide shows that there are different aspects of the mediators themselves, your styles, your behaviors, your gender, your biases. 
aspects of the disputants themselves, the parties that are there. They study aspects of the conflict, how intense it is. Is it around identity issues, religious issues, ideology, something else? Uh, aspects of the mediation situation, the context of the mediation, um, the broader context, cultural differences, organizational support for mediation, and then the various strategies and tactics that are used and what that means for outcomes. So they're studying a lot of things, but it's really hard to know, again, given all of this, what's the story that the science tells us that you as a mediator would find useful, right? So what we did from this is we ran a study with about 150 expert mediators from around the world, some were on the uh, UN mediation support roster, others were involved in domestic mediation, so it was an eclectic group. And we really said, okay, we wanna know, A, what was your last case? And then B, we asked them, based on most of these things, to kind of tell us the story of what happened in the mediation. Was it mostly about a, a problem, or was it a relationship? Was it a contract, or a relationship? Uh, and, and to distinguish these different things. And what we were interested in is, of all the things in mediation that matter, when a mediator comes into a, a conflict situation, are there some aspects of the situation that are most important, that will determine whether they use this strategy or this strategy? We found that four things, these mediators told us that fundamentally four things mattered, right? So one is just the level of intensity or destructiveness of the conflict. So some conflicts are lower level, people can talk, they can sit in the same room. Other conflicts are not. There's violence potential, there's high intensity. Um, and so that is concern number one. The degree of kind of cooperativeness of the relationships and the issues, do they have common ground? Are there things you can work out? Or is this truly a kind of win-lose, scarce resource kind of conflict, right? So that matters. Um, the, con the flexibility or constraints of the context. So sometimes you're meeting in a space where you've only got two hours, or you've got lawyers in the room who are expensive, or it's a private mediation, so whatever happens will be, I mean, sorry, public mediation will be exposed. So there are all these kinds of constraints which really limit what you can and can't do. So how constrained is the situation? And then ultimately, are there issues that people aren't talking about? So do you either intuitively or through other information know that whatever the group's talking about is not the st full story and you need to somehow find out what's really going on here if you, if you feel like you can have any impact. So these are the four things that came out of this sort of long study we did of 150 mediators. Um, and what's important to know is, so, so, so these things matter, but they kind of matter together. They kind of interact together. So if you go one more slide, we did a, we basically took those four different types of situ, uh, situations and what they create is, go two slides ahead if you can. Not that one, that's too confusing. They create, you know, sort of 16 types of mediation. So you have situations where, that are unconstrained, that are mostly cooperative, that are kind of low intensity. So like this whole area is low intensity. This is more high intensity situations of conflict. These areas are more, these are covert issues. These are uh, not covert issues. So, they, these things combine in ways to create kind of specific situations which may lend themselves to very different kinds of strategies, right? So this was kind of a hypothesis that these four situation types of distinctions matter and they combine to create these situations. So what we did in the next uh, study was uh, bring in mediators and maybe some of you were there, but we did a series of focus groups with mediators and said, okay, so when you're faced with a situation like this, what's important to you, what do you do, what are you trying to achieve, and what are the strategies you use? So we had a variety of focus groups trying to elicit from practitioners. And I wanna stress one thing. We started with the kind of science and published literature. So we're trying to learn from science. And then we take that and go, and we talk to people like you who have experiences mediating and say, does this make sense to you? What do you do in these types of situations? How do you respond? So we're trying to really learn from practice as well as synthesize the research, right? So we ran these focus groups and that helped us get a better understanding of in particular situations, what matters, right? And what, is, what do mediators do in those situations to be impactful? And what came out of this was uh, kind of a, 
sort of a flow model. It's a, it's a simpler story than 16 situations, which is good news, right? So w walk through with me. So this is what we call a construct of adaptive mediation, which means that what we're finding is that mediators have very different strategies that they use in very different kinds of situations. And what is important is their ability to kind of read how either a situation is changing, or if you're moving from one mediation into another mediation, realizing that there are some fundamental differences in those, and how to adjust your strategies and tactics, okay? And the more effective we are at that, the more effective we are as mediators, the more endurable the, the, the resolutions we come to, and the more higher chances of probability of agreements, and more sustainable they are. Um, but it's hard to do, because usually we're trained to do mediation in one way. And what we're finding is that we really need to think out of the box about what is mediation and how do we do it effectively, okay? So the first thing we find is that most mediators, can you hit it one more time? So most mediators are trained in kind of a standard model, generally speaking, crudely speaking. This is often true. We've trained third graders in mediation, through, uh, some of them through the Children's Creative Response to Conflict. Um, uh, Priscilla Brustman is here who directs that program. Um, and we've worked at the UN extensively around the world in training mediators. And there is a sort of basic set of ideas and skills that we train. And it's what we call mediation. And the strategy is to try to open dialogue, to try to um, ideally, as a mediator, disappear as much as possible from the process, um, encourage more cooperative problem solving, relational processes, and creativity so that people can get to kind of win-win integrative solutions, reflect, ask questions, et cetera. And so there are a variety of kind of strategies that are associated with the, what we call the kind of main canon of what mediators are trained to do, right? But the first thing that happens that they attend to is if things intensify, if they escalate, if they become dangerous or threatening, um, or they know that coming in, then they use a whole different set of tactics, right? And this is a role that we call the medic. This is like uh, what, what, where you want to manage or l decrease intensity so that mediation is possible. And as some of you who mediate realize, sometimes it isn't. You realize, I, we can't do it here. This is bad. It's tense. It's too dangerous for me or them or us. So you either end it or the you know, security comes in or you have to wait until the parties cool down enough to reconvene, right? So there are a set of patterns and strategies and levers associated with that. And again, that's not something that we train terribly effectively. We, we, we give people a couple of options in community mediation and certainly international mediation when things heat up. But we don't really think systematically about what do you do to decrease the tension and to keep parties at the table ideally, right? So that's question number one, which is again, is this a high intensity or low intensity situation? And what are the strategies and tactics you'd use to move it here, okay? And then the next, if you hit it one more time and again, the next question you kind of ask is, what is the context and are, is this highly constrained? So do we have enough time to do this? Do we have enough resources to do this? Um, is it going to be a public process or can, we, it, can it be a confidential private process, et cetera? And the higher the constraints, the more that people need to alter their strategy and not do what usually they're trained to do, but work in a very different way. And sometimes that means warning them, threatening them, being explicit about the constraints, limiting their aspirations and saying, we're never going to get there. We might be able to talk about this issue. So it really is a, a highly controlling process if the situation is so constrained that you really don't have the space to do what we call mediation, right? And that's sort of the role that we call the fixer. You kind of come in and say, this is the best we can do given these constraints. Should we still do this? Make sense? OK. Second, uh, another consideration is the quality of the relationship. So is this a purely competitive environment? Is it a purely cooperative environment? Or is some mix of both? So again, mediators are trained to believe that ideally there is some kind of integrative way to solve problems. We can find some common ground between these parties, and we can work together to do that. But A, many uh, mediations aren't that way, right? The parties are, are so antagonistic, 
or the issues are really trade-off issues that it's really about bargaining. So in those situations, you need to understand as a referee, how do you set up a system that's fair, but really is about competitive distributive bargaining, which is something oftentimes mediators aren't trained to do, right? With this exception, I, went to, I was speaking at UCLA last year, and the, uh, my host said, you know, mediation is pervasive in California. Lawyers use it all, all the time, but it's not what you think it is. Mediation in California, he claims, is competitive, uh, is basically this. He said that most mediators use mediation, but he said, I, I train mediation at UCL Law School. I don't train integrative negotiation and, and integrative mediation. I train them how to help people bargain because that's what they do as lawyers. And if I train them to do something else, they come back to me and say, why did you train me in that? It's a waste of time. I never get a chance to do that. People in disputes, legal disputes typically, are in a win-lose mentality, and that's what I need to have to manage, right? So in, in that place, in that space, mediation is used a lot, but it's this, and that's in fact what they're training, not how many of us have been trained on this, on this coast, I think. So there is a difference, and part of it, again, is understanding, is the situation highly competitive? Is it very constrained in terms of the com 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 competitiveness of the relationships and the interests? In which case, what, how do I do that? And how would I do that well? And am I trained to do that effectively, right? And then the final consideration is how covert the issues are. So again, you as a mediator might be in a conversation and initially it, you think it's clear what's happening and then you start to get a feel that this is wrong. Something else is operating here. Something maybe more fundamental. Maybe there's some abuse here. Maybe there's some illegal, something illegal happening here and you, but you can't get to it publicly. And that's what a role that we call the sort of the therapist, which is to usually caucus, break people apart, and then go into a different mode where you do some kind of fact finding and gathering about what is going on here and what is this and can you tell me alone so that we can figure out a strategy to address it. But again, that's a whole kind of set of skills that we don't emphasize nearly enough, right? So this was this kind of alternative model that we call adaptive mediation, which is the capacity to, if you're trained like this, can you sort of identify when things escalate and what to do, when things are highly competitive and what to do, when things are highly constrained for various reasons and how to respond to that, or when there are issues that people aren't comfortable either sharing with the other disputant or maybe with you, how do you start to understand what those are and then assess whether mediation works or not. Right? So the, the point of all this is how do, we make media, how do we use science and research to make mediation ideally a process that is as effective as it can be? And one rationale is that we have to understand the nature of the situations that we're facing and be trained so that we can adequately do different things. Now some people will say, look, I, I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained as a therapist. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. That's fine, but it's important to know that there are cases that may need that and you may have to either work with somebody else or say, I don't go there. I, you know, I can't do that. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I'm a business person. This is what I do well and I'm going to limit my, my caseload to this, right? So part of it is knowing ourselves, but part of it is how we sort of think about the field. Okay, a couple more things. So we've uh, done, recently done another study where we tried to go more deeply into this and say, all right, specifically in each of these areas, what do you do? And the first thing we found, we can go one more, is that most mediators that we did in this, surveyed in this next study, have this kind of basic canon of mediation tactics, right? So people are try to be unbiased, they brainstorm options, they check their understanding with disputants and verify their understanding of the issues, encourage self-reflection or responsibility, and they try to model constructiveness. This is mediation 101. This is how most of us are generally taught to be mediators. They tend not to kind of tell anecdotal stories or encourage, tell the parties what to do um, or even arbitrate, ultimately sort of take ownership of, about the decision process. They really use most of these. So in our research across all the different situations, most mediators said, yeah, I do that. This is kind of a basic st standard, right? So this is the kind of mediation standard. But then if you go to the next slide, which is the sort of medic slide, the emphasis becomes very different. You create a safe atmosphere, manage the difficult parties, 
really lean in, be focused, observe carefully, monitor the nonverbals, provide very clear structure, maybe some time, break time to kind of be able to explore things with people, et cetera. So the process changes when their things are high intensity. As you attempt to understand, lower the intensity, deal with a very different set of issues. You can go to the next one. Um, if the constraints are high, you then stress confidentiality, you talk about the constraints, you help the parties figure out how they might be able to navigate within those constraints, keep them at the table, et cetera. So there's a set of specific tactics that people tend to move into to manage that. Again, and if they can't, then they may decide mediation doesn't work here. If they can, then they can sort of move into a more standard mode. Um, the next is, again, uh, situations that you see have very competitive structures or very competitive relationships or antagonism between the parties. And then you want to, again, provide clear structure, but encourage distributive bargaining and trade-offs and compromises and, and, and know how to do that, right? Be trained to be a good distributive bargainer, which much, many of us are not trained as. Help them save face, manage their expectations, lower their expectations often, and say, you know, this is probably the best we're going to get here because there aren't really win-win solutions here, so we may want to uh, reduce our ex expectations. It's more uh, controlling of the process, et cetera. People might want to educate a little bit about missing information. They may cite a relevant law or rule. Um, and they may even warn parties uh, about the consequences of not settling, right? So these are more unique strategies to these kinds of situations. And then the last one is this, what we call the therapist, which is, again, stressing confidentiality, caucusing, having, talking to people individually, uh, helping them save face, a deeper exploration of the conflict, the history, the underlying issues on a one-on-one -on -one basis or one party to mediator basis, interrogation, maybe exploration of forgiveness and apologies, and is that a possibility? Hit, you know, exploring the hidden issues, et cetera. It's really digging deeper, taking the time and space to do that, right? So this is a very different toolkit. And if you go to the next one, the, the point that we're finding is that this idea matters. This is what we call kind of a meta-competency in mediation. That it's not just being able to list, listen and be respectful and under, uh, understand common ground and help parties communicate on that but that there are a very different set of skill sets or strategies that we need, we, and we need to be able to A, kind of assess differences in situations, and then B, respond to those situations in a way that matter. And then under those conditions, you have much more efficacy in mediation and much more sustainability with the solutions. If you go to one more. Uh, so there's a lot of research on this we've done in negotiation and other capacities that shows that when people are more adaptive, it leads to higher levels of efficacy and satisfaction with the mediation process. Um, you know, basically it's good. You know, what we found, particularly like in work settings, is that people that use different strategies and very different kinds of negotiations and mediations uh, feel uh, better at work, more of a sense of efficacy, better about the relationships at work, better about conflict, and less inclination to quit. So it creates a climate where people feel like they have more tools and more options and therefore a bit more control over their life, particularly the tense components of their life. So both in negotiation and mediation, we find that this is an important impact. And then there are two other things that I just want to end with. So one of the things we found in working with the UN mediation support system is that not only do we believe now that being adaptive to different kinds of situations matters. And again, it's one thing to say that we need to be adaptive and adjust. It's another thing to say, these are the things you really want to be looking for when things are high intensity, low, when they're highly constrained or not. It gives a little bit more of a sense of guidelines for what to do when, right? Other than to say, be adaptive and good luck, right? It is be adaptive, but around certain things. And in these situations, sometimes it requires that we are be able, be able to blend strategies. So we may want to do a win-win integrative thing on some issues, but realize that there are competitive issues as well, and they're going to just have to compromise and do trade-offs on those. And you need to find ways to do both at the same time. 
And that's, again, hard to do. It's kind of an advanced set of skills. Uh, more expert negotiators and mediators are more inclined to figure out how to do this, but we don't train and teach this, right? And it's an important thing to realize. And then the final thing I'll say is, one of the things I was kind of astounded by when we started to work with the Mediation Support Unit at the UN, and this is true with most mediators, I think, is these mediators all to a person are going into immensely complicated and threatening situations, whether they're envoys or they're on the, the mediation support uh, rapport list. Um, they're coming into situations that are complex with long histories and with many actors on the, on the ground, oftentimes NGOs and other non-state actors who are either trying to build peace or trying to create war. So these are complex systems. And what the, mediation, what the UN doesn't have and what many institutions don't have that are working in peace building and, and, and peacemaking is, is, a, is a good sense of the system. Who else is there? What's operating? So these, are smart, these, media, these envoys are smart people and they're given some resources to have some historical context to the issues that they're facing in a particular country context, but they oftentimes are not mindful of who else is there, how long have they been there, what are they doing that is very consistent with what they're trying to do anyway. Are there local actors that are working quite effectively that what they're doing may actually undermine, right? They don't know the systems. And I'm really struck by that. So one of the things we've been strongly advocating is the capacity before entry into a system of really mapping the system and mapping a sense of who's doing what where, what are the relationships that are there, and using that to inform a sense of context so that when they go in, they at least do no harm. And it increases the probability that they can work with what's already happening to build peace or make peace and not have to impose some kind of external solution. And that's hard for various organizations, particularly hard for the UN for a variety of reasons, but it's a critically important component, I think, to effective mediation and, and peacemaking. Okay, I think that's my stuff.